my name is Justin Davis. I'm from Imperial College London. It's my pleasure to present this third in a series of lectures on behalf of Past Test, which comprise the MRCP Part 2 cardiology series. This lecture will cover advanced cardiac imaging underpinning the diagnosis of common cardiac pathologies. We start with question one. A 31-year-old anxious barrister presents to his GP complaining of fainting episodes which have had a recent onset. He does not attribute his faints to any particular activity and sometimes he has noticed lightheadedness even if he has not changed position or at rest. On further questioning, he admits to having felt increasingly tired and has lost about 5 kilograms of weight in the preceding two months. He has been otherwise fit and well and is not on any medications. He is a non-smoker. He admits to being very concerned since his father died suddenly at a similar age. He does not know the cause of his father's death. Positive findings on examination include clubbing of his fingers and a raised JVP. Auscultation of the heart reveals a loud first heart sound, a third heart sound and a systolic murmur at the apex. Neurological examination was normal. Just give you a moment to consider which of these stems provides the most likely diagnosis. If you opted for D, atrial myxoma, you were correct. Atrial myxoma accounts for about 50% of all primary cardiac tumours and has a higher incidence in women than men. More frequently originates from the left side of the heart than the right and frequently from the fossa ovalis. When it is found, it is frequently associated with an elevated uh, ESR. Characteristically, a tumour plot or an S3 is uh, frequently described. Patients frequently present with symptoms of presyncope, syncope, signs of left and right heart failure, and sometimes they present with sudden death in about 15% of cases. Echocardiography is by far the best way of diagnosing a left atrial myxoma, but before we jump in and look at an abnormal echo from someone with a left atrial myxoma, let's look at what a normal echo is. There are certain views we take in echo which are standard. As you see on the screen here, on the left side of your screen and the upper portion of your screen, this is a parasternal long axis view. This is done by positioning the probe just adjacent to the sternum and by angling the probe very slightly to give us the views you see on the bottom left hand side of the screen. On the far side of the screen here you see an apical or four chamber view which gives us the classic Valentine's Day heart where you see all the chambers in what we conceive and, and conceptually think about a normal arrangement. Of course, this is upside down, it's just the way how the echo image is projected on the screen. By rotating the probe from the parasternal view by 90 degrees, it's possible to get the short axis cut, which you see on the far right hand lower corner of your screen. In this view here, we get a cross section of the left ventricle, and depending on the angle, we can focus in on the aortic valve, mitral valve, or the apex of the heart. Here are two normal uh, 2D echocardiographic images. On the left is a parasternal long axis view and on the right is a parasternal short axis view. You can see the clear and beautiful definition of the left ventricular lumen. You can see the mitral valve, the left atrium and the aortic outflow tract. If you turn the probe through 90 degrees to get a cross-sectional cut or the parasternal short axis cut, you can see the left ventricle on FAS with the two mitral valve annuluses. So what do we get in someone with a left atrial myxoma? Well, it's clear to see that these two echocardiographic images are very abnormal. You can see that there's a smooth mass resting in the left atrium, which appears tethered to one of the mitral valve leaflets. And this is obvious both in the parasternal long axis view, which is on the left side of your screen, and in the apical four-chamber view on the far side of the screen. When we see this, this is almost diagnostic alone of a left atrial myxoma. If we detect this on an echocardiographic image, particularly as in a patient we described in this last question, we then put the patient forward for surgery. Surgery is usually very successful and usually the tumours don't reoccur. We'll now look at question two. A 27-year-old woman who is 24 weeks into her first pregnancy is referred by her GP to the cardiology department complaining of palpitations. 
There is no past medical history of note and she is on no medications. On examination there is a systolic murmur and a fixed splitting of the second heart sound. Her 12 lead electrocardiogram shows left axis deviation with a right bundle branch block. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? I'll give you a moment to consider the options. If you went for B, osteum primum atrial septal defect, you were correct. We'll now move on to the second part of this question, question three. Which of the following is the most likely risk to the pregnancy? I'll once again give you a few seconds to consider the options. If you went for A, no significant increase in risk compared to the general population, you'd be correct. This is the chest radiograph of someone with an atrial septal defect in which the, the lesion was detected too late. You can see that the heart is enlarged and particularly the right ventricle has become displaced. When thinking about abnormal structures in the right heart, it's important to know the structure which should normally be present. And here we look at a slide of the right atrium opened up to look at these structures. At the very top of your screen, you see the superior vena cava, and at the bottom of your scene, screen, you see the inferior vena cava. There are some other normal structures here. In the, one of the blue arrows labels the coronary sinus. This, of course, provides the blood supply coming back from the heart muscle, draining the coronary arteries. You also see the atrioventricular node, which is important in normal conduction down the heart. And you can also see the tricuspid valve itself. In addition to this, these normal structures, this slide also shows evidence of abnormal structures. Here you can see a secundum AOSD right in the middle, a primum AOSD abutted the tricuspid valve, and other defects such as the sinus venosum defect high up in the right atrium, or an IVC defect low down in the atrium. Left untreated, atrial septal defects carry a poor prognosis with 50% of patients being dead age 50. It accounts for about 33% of adult congenital heart disease, with secundum ASDs accounting for about 75%, and the rest split between premum and sinus venosum defects. Secundum ASDs are frequently associated with mitral valve prolapse, and premum ASDs are frequently associated with cleft mitral valves. Sinus venosum defects are associated with junctional rhythms, atrial arrhythmias, and anomalous pulmonary veins. So by far and away the most common presentation of an atrial septal defect is with breathlessness. However, other problems one could expect to see would be atrial arrhythmias, right ventricular failure as the right ventricle expands under an increased volume and pressure load, pulmonary hypertension, this is a, again as a result of the increased volume and increased pressure in the right ventricle, mild mitral regurgitation, paradoxical emboli, this is as little blood clots travel from the right side of the heart through the defect into the left side of the heart and then can go up to the brain or the systemic organ, organs or spontaneous bacterial endocarditis. This is as there's a defect there, it's easy for bacteria to colonize an abnormal endothelial surface. Generally speaking, there's no flow in neonates as the pulmonary vascular resistance is high and systemic vascular resistance is low. So generally speaking, atrial septal defects are well tolerated until early adulthood. As I've said, one of the main problems is the pressure loading on the right ventricle, which is a low pressure structure, which is thin walled as opposed to the much thicker walled left ventricle. As the pressure builds up, the right heart dilates up and it becomes a very, very poor pump. Atrial septal defects should be closed if the systemic saturations fall less than 92%, or the shunt ratio, which we discussed in lecture two, exceeds 1.5 to 1. There are two broad techniques used for closing these defects. Open chest surgery, which has existed for many years now, involves opening the chest and putting a patch over the defect. This is a very simple procedure for a cardiothoracic surgeon to perform. It's very successful, but of course it's an open operation and has an extended recovery period. More recently, it's possible to perform these um, atrial septal defect repairs percutaneously. 
This is by using a closure device which is pushed up from the right femoral vein. The advantage of this, of course, is it's simple, it's minimally invasive, often only requiring a, a prolonged um, admission over the course of a day or perhaps a single night stay, and the patient can go home. The, diffic the difficulties of this procedure is it's very difficult to treat fenestrated atrium where there are more than one hole. One question we're frequently asked by candidates is what's the difference between an ASD and a patent for amin ovale? So I'm just going to summarise the differences here. An atrocyptal defect is a structural abnormality. It's open throughout the whole of the cardiac cycle. It's usually larger than a patent for amin ovale, less common, and is associated with more symptoms and complications as pressures can be allowed to move from the left side of the heart to the right side of the heart throughout the whole cardiac cycle for much longer periods of um, the patient's lifespan. Patent for amin ovale, of course, is very different. This is a structure which we're all born with, and in the vast majority of patients, it, the patent for amin ovale closes up early on in life. It's not open all the time, and it only opens when pressure in the left atrium or the right atrium exceeds the other atrial pressure, allowing blood to move either from the left to the right or the right to the left. It's usually far smaller, and as I've said, it's a very common phenomenon. It's associated with few symptoms and few complications. And indeed, in most patients, they're totally unaware that they actually have a patent for amin ovale. And the first time they may be told about this is when they come up for a routine echocardiographic study for an unrelated request. In this image here, you can see a percutaneous uh, ASD closure device which has been implanted across the atrial septal defect. There's two sides to this device, one which sits in the left atrium and one which sits in the right atrium. They get pulled together to form an umbrella-like structure which straddles the hole. These little legs are filled with a membrane which over time becomes endothelialized, closing up the atrial septal defect in its entirety. This is a very successful technique and in the vast majority of cases, certainly when there's an uncomplicated ASD, is the treatment of choice. Question four. You review a 54-year-old woman who is tired and lethargic. She's undergone multiple dental extractions during the past few months. There is a past history of Sydenham's career, but nil else of note. On examination, you notice subungual splinter hemorrhages and an ejection systolic murmur. Which of the following represents the best initial investigation in this case? I'll give you a moment to consider the options. If you went for A, at least three sets of blood cultures from different sides, you'd be correct. The second stem to this question is question five. While cultures are awaited, which of the following represents the best choice for antibiotic therapy in this patient? I'll again give you a moment to consider the different stems for this question. If you went for option E, penicillin and IV gentamicin, you'd be correct. Different criteria have been developed for diagnosis of infective endocarditis. One of the best of these is the Dukes criteria. There are certain major and minor criteria which together can build up a picture which is consistent with the diagnosis of endocarditis. So, what are the major criteria in blood cultures? Well, these will be positive blood cultures with a typical infective endocarditis microorganism, such as strep virodans, S. bovis, or HACEK group, or community acquired Staph aureus or Enterococci in the absence of a primary focus. Or it could be microorganisms consistent with infective endocarditis from persistently positive blood cultures. So let's look at the Duke's criteria, this time looking at major criteria from an imaging point of view. So this will be evidence of endocardial involvement with a positive echo. So this will be typically an oscillating intracardiac mass on a valve or supporting structure, often in the path of a regurgitant jet or implanted material, in the absence of an alternative anatomical explanation.
It may be the identification of an abscess, and this may be on a transthoracic, or probably more frequently on a transesophageal echocardiogram. Or it could be the new partial dehiscence of a prosthetic valve or valvular regurgitation. And this may be in the presence of worsening or changing pre-existing murmur. So what about the minor criteria? Will these be, be predisposing factors, such as having a known cardiac lesion, using recreational drugs, particularly patients who inject recreational drugs, patients who have a fever more than 38 degrees centigrade, or evidence of emboli? can also be patients who have immunological problems such as glomerulonephritis or osseous nodes or positive blood cultures that don't meet the major criteria or a positive echocardiogram that doesn't meet the major criteria. So once we've assembled these major and minor criteria of the Duke's uh, scoring system, we then can confirm endocarditis by having two major criteria, one major and three minor criteria or five minor criteria. I'm now going to show you a series of slides where a patient had an, a prosthetic valve with endocarditis. The first slide is a 2D echocardiographic image which demonstrates the prosthetic valve rocking around with evidence of what looks like a mass with a very prominent jet which looks to be extending from the left ventricle into the left atrium. The second slide is a transesophageal echocardiographic study of the same patient. In this side, slide here, on the left side of your screen, you can see the valve rocking around. And on the right side of the screen, you can once again see a very prominent regurgitant jet. The finding of this valve which is rocking around and this marked regurgitation in context of what looks like a mass present as well is very, very suspicious for a patient having endocarditis. The third image is a three-dimensional echocardiographic study which we perform, which shows clear evidence of the valve rocking around and only being attached by a couple of the original sutures to the, to the annulus. The last slide I'm going to show you here is in the same patient after he had a replaced mitral valve. You can clearly see that this valve is now beautifully seated the valve leaflets are open nicely and there's only very, very minimal mitral regurgitation present. So what are the predictors of poor outcome in a patient with infective endocarditis? Well, certainly patients who are older, those who are known to have a prosthetic valve which is infected, patients who are less good at clearing the bulk, and these would be patients who are insulin-dependent diabetics, or those with other comorbidities, such as patients who are very frail, previous cardiovascular disease, or renal or pulmonary disease. Other predictors of poor outcome really are based around potential complications. These would be the development of heart failure, which can occur with marked regurgitation, such as the aortic valve breaks down, allowing fulminant regurgitation. Renal failure, as maybe as a result of sepsis. Stroke as a result of embolus, septic shock, or periannular complications. And of course, the organisms carry different risks. Particularly nasty organisms include Staph aureus, fungi or gram-negative bacilli. Echocardiographic findings can also help us to predict who's got a poor outcome in infective endocarditis. The findings we'll be most wary of are those with periannular complications, severe left-sided valvular regurgitation, low left ventricular ejection fractions, pulmonary hypertension, very large mobile vegetations, severe prosthetic dysfunction, premature mitral valve closure and other signs of diastolic pressure rise. We now do the final question, question six. A 19-year-old college student presents with a history of three episodes of transient loss of consciousness over the past two months. All three episodes happened while the patient was standing and were preceded by a feeling of nausea, warmth and lightheadedness. He regains consciousness shortly after the collapse but he continues to feel nauseated and fatigued for about 15 minutes. There's no past medical history of note, and his physical examination is unremarkable, and there's no evidence of autostatic hypotension. His father died of a myocardial infarction aged 60 years of age. Investigations reveal normal electrocardiogram, chest radiograph, complete blood count and electrolytes. An echocardiogram is also reported as normal. Which of the following is the most appropriate next step in the evaluation of this patient?
I'll just give you a moment to consider the options. If you went for answer E, tilt table test, you'd be correct. Syncope or presyncope is a very common referral to cardiology clinics. By far and away the most important thing you can do, rather than jumping into any investigations, is to take a full and detailed history. As the history alone will often give you the diagnosis without doing any investigations. Importantly, we must distinguish between cardiac or non-cardiac causes and subdividing these cardiac causes into those which are vasovagal in origin and those which are likely to be arrhythmogenic in origin. On the slide here you see an, a broad outline which we may use to help us down this management pathway. So those which are likely to be vagal-vagal in, uh, in origin are on the left side of the screen. So these include feelings of dizziness, lightheadedness, or posturally related symptoms, or awareness that the episode is about to happen. This is in sharp contrast to those of cardiac arrhythmias such as ventricular tachycardia or neurological causes of which the patient has absolutely no warning and the first thing they know about it, they're on the floor, often recovering with a group of patients or people around them. So let's look at some of the pathophysiology underlying the last question we've just done. So vasovagal syncope is a simultaneous enhancement of parasympathetic nervous tone or vagal tone and the withdrawal of sympathetic nervous system tone. This results in a spectrum of hemodynamic responses. So with enhanced parasympathetic tone, we can get a drop in heart rate, so-called negative chronotropic effect, and a fall in cardiac contractility, a negative inotropic effect. The net result of these two, both in isolation or together, is a decrease in the cardiac output. The other response which may occur is that of a vasodepressor or loss of sympathetic tone, and this is predominantly related to a large fall in blood pressure with little change in heart rate, and this is usually the result of vasodilatation. So investigations of uh, syncope or presyncope include uh, monitoring the electrical activity of the heart, this may be with a halter monitor or an event monitor, an echocardiographic study to ensure that the heart is structurally normal, and a tilt test to see how the physiology reacts to changes in posture. If these primary investigations prove negative, then we may move on to more invasive procedures. These include implantation of a loop recorder, or so-called reveal device, or an electrophysiological study to try and provoke an arrhythmia, such as a VT stim. There are many precipitating factors for vagal vagal syncope. These include prolonged standing up, such as the Coldstream Guards whilst on parade, standing up very quickly from sitting, stressful situations, unpleasant stimuli such as venipuncture, sudden extreme emotion, dehydration, urination, so-called micturation syncope, or defecation, so-called defecation syncope, or cold water, the so-called mammalian diving reflex. The treatment would involve, at least initially, avoidance of any stimuli which is known to provoke vasovagal syncope in an individual patient. Various isometric manoeuvres, such as clenching the calf muscles to increase the venous return to the heart and therefore prevent blood pressure falling. Avoidance techniques, so if there's a particular thing which would precipitate vasovagal syncope, you'd advise the patient to avoid it. Of course, we'd want to reduce the antihypertensive therapies a the patient may be on, because it may be those which are provoking these episodes. We'd want to push blood pressure up in someone who had low blood pressure by asking them to increase their fluid and salt intake moderately. We could advise graded compression stockings, and in some very rare cases we will offer implantation of a permanent pacemaker. That concludes